Uh, the lecture this time is about the equations of motion for B. Of course, since we're dealing with statics here, uh, then these are the equations of equilibrium for beams based on the classical displacement field which we discussed uh, last time, which is essentially the rigid motion, translation, and rotation of the cross-section. So in order to derive equations of motion, we use the principle of virtual work, and the principle of virtual work requires the total virtual work done by both external forces and internal forces. We have already analyzed the virtual work done by internal forces in the previous lecture. So this lecture, we start by the virtual work done by the external forces. And that's reasonably simple to derive, but we need first to decide on what type of loads we want to consider. Um, we want to consider, of course, combinations of um, concentrated loads and distributed loads. And let's start with the distributed loads. So if this is the beam axis Z, we can have a distributed loading in Z direction. This is load per unit length in Z direction. This is called this PZ. So the question now is, how would PZ arrive in arise in, in practice, because uh, I think we are all familiar with distributed loads in other directions. For example, if we take Y to be the vertical, Z to be the direction of the beam, I think we are all reasonably okay with the idea of PPY which is load per unit length in y direction. We can easily imagine this being to be a ring, and then this distributed loading in y direction would be a lift distribution. And correspondingly, we can have a distributed load in x direction, which would be kind of a drag distribution over the ring. But what about p z? p z arises naturally in cases where we have, for example, self-weight. So self-weight is a very uh, easy way for um, PZ to uh, arise. So let's say that you have a building like this. Let's say a very tall skyscraper or something. Yeah. And of course, it has a certain self weight. So it is not very difficult to see that the normal force here is zero, while the normal force at the root is going to be the whole weight of the building. But this is talking already about the total normal force. If we are talking about the external load, really, not the internal force arising from that internal load, then what we can do is we can take the delta Z here, it's a small slice of the building, and then the total weight acting on it is the mass of this part, which is, is the mass per unit length is rho. It's going to be rho 
which itself might be function of z times z times delta z. So the load per unit length, which is net force per third, divided by delta z, is rho times c, and with a negative sign because if this is z, the loading here is in the negative z direction. So, so this would be a case where p of z equals minus rho times c, where g is the gravity acceleration and rho is the weight per unit length of the building. So it also naturally arises, it's not an artificial thing to, to apply. Uh, another type of loading which is quite frequent and especially for wings is that um, the cross section of the wing is in the shape of an airfoil. Uh, usually the shear center, which is in the center of rotation of the, of the wing, is somewhere in the middle, while the center uh, the point of application of aerodynamic forces, which let us call that the aerodynamic center, is essentially symmetric, of course, um, is somewhere ahead of that. So the lift force, for example, will be acting here, and we are taking moments along beam reference axis here. Then you can easily see that there is some uh, there is some torque. So what you can also have is a distributed torque which we're going to refer to as mz. So mz is the distributed torque where the positive direction is with the right hand zone. So you can have also the distributed torque and yeah. Yeah, so essentially these are the four types of loads we are going to consider. Px, Py, Pz, and mz. So Pz is a distributed thrust or normal force, Mz is a distributed torque, and Py and Pz are lateral distributed loads which cause shear forces and bending. Now it's time to write down the equation for the external, uh, the work, the work of external forces. So W external is going to be. It's very easy in the case of the forces because essentially the virtual work is nothing other than force times displacement. So the force is PZ DZ and we multiply that by the displacement in the direction of force which is delta W. And the same will go for PY and PX. And then we integrate over the beam in order to find the net work done. The work done of the, uh, due to the distributed moment is going to be similar. The net moment on a certain length is mz dz. And then moment in order to get work you multiply by the virtual rotation at that moment at that point, around the same axis around which the moment vector is acting, in which case this will be uh, delta theta z. You did you sum over the whole length in order to get the total work done by external forces. So this gives us the total work done by external forces in the form of an integral over the beam. Uh, if we have concentrated forces, of course, it will be force multiplied by the moment, uh, uh, by the displacement at that point. If it is a concentrated moment, it will be the moment multiplied by the virtual rotation at that particular point. So this kind of um, illustrates the virtual work of external forces. Now we have the virtual work of internal forces and external forces. If we sum the two, we get the total virtual work, which has to be zero for equilibrium to be satisfied. 
So now let's do some virtual work, which is the sum of the internal virtual work and the virtual work of internal forces and external forces is going to be minus integration n delta w prime plus n x delta theta x prime minus m y delta theta y prime plus s x delta u prime minus delta theta y plus s y delta v prime plus delta theta x plus m z delta x z prime d z. This is the internal and then the external is integration of the x delta u plus u y delta b plus e z delta w plus m z delta z. And this has to be zero for every choice of delta x, delta y, delta c delta theta x, delta theta y, delta theta z, delta u, delta v, delta delta. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is to note that the displacements and rotations are independent. So we can choose delta u independently, delta v independently, delta w independently, and so forth and so on. Uh, and since we have six different variations, independent variations or virtual displacements to to choose, then automatically uh, we have here a situation where we will end up with six equilibrium equations. An equilibrium equation for each one of the variables. Um, so if you want to find the equation for sigma forces in Z equals zero, then we look for the equation that would arise from the, the coefficient of delta w because w is the displacement in the direction and virtual work is force and displacement in the direction of the force. So essentially the coefficient of delta w would be sum of the forces in, in, in the direction. So setting the coefficient of delta w to zero would be the same as setting uh, the sum of forces in Z to be zero. If you want the, sum, the equation that says summation of forces in X is zero, then we set delta, the coefficient of delta U to zero. If we want the equation that says that sigma forces in Y is zero, we set the coefficient of delta V is zero. The same goes for the rotation. So the coefficient of delta theta X, when we set it to zero, this will be the equilibrium, the moment equilibrium around the x-axis, coefficient of delta theta y would give us the moment equilibrium around the y-axis, and the coefficient of delta theta z is going to give us the moment equilibrium around the z-axis. So what we can do is we can essentially work, uh, of course we can do that for all variations simultaneously, but that would be a bit tedious. But since these variations are independent, we can treat them one by one. So we can start looking at, for example, first at the terms which contain delta W. So if we look, and this will be equilibrium of forces in the direction. So what we do for this is we look at the terms which contain the alpha w, which are integration.
of minus L delta W prime dz plus integration of dz delta W dz equals zero. So we integrate by parts. Let us say that the limited integrations are from zero to L, where L is a finite length of the beam, so we have a beam here of length L. Yeah. So if we proceed with this, we of course we need the operations of delta W. Here we have delta W prime, so we need to integrate by parts. So when we do that, we will get minus n delta W from zero to L plus integration from 0 to L n prime delta W dz plus integration from 0 to L dz delta W dz Yep, and this is equal to zero. So for now, I'm going to neglect the boundary terms. We're going to discuss them in a second. Uh, but then these terms here, the integral terms, we can write them as integration from zero to L and prime plus PZ delta w z equals zero and this tells us automatically when we set the coefficient of delta w to zero because delta w is arbitrary this gives us that equilibrium equation to be n prime plus p z equals zero so the rate of change of the normal force plus the distributed load per unit length is going to be zero at every point. So this is the equilibrium equation, the force equilibrium equation in that direction. So it is interesting to start looking at the business of boundary conditions. In order to do that, let us say that we just start using a, a concrete example where we have an applied force here. Let us call this force P. Yeah. And we have a support here which prevents motion in the direction. Yeah. And there can be some also distributed load. PZ, it doesn't matter. So if we look at the total virtual work, the total virtual work for this case, we we'll find that there has to be an additional term in the external, the work, uh, virtual work of external forces because of the applied force P. So if we write W for this case, it will be minus integration N delta W prime dz plus integration of PZ delta W dz plus P times delta W at the point where um, the force is applied and this is at Z equals L. So now when we integrate, and this has to be of course zero for every choice of delta W, so when we integrate by parts now, we're going to have the following. We're going to have, as before, integration from zero to L n prime plus pz delta w pz. This is not going to change. What is going to change is that the boundary terms now will be different. So there will be one boundary term that says p minus n at l times delta w at l. Yeah, and a term that says plus n at zero, delta w at zero. 
Yeah. And all this is equal to zero. So essentially what we have here is a combination of three terms. A term for the right boundary, a term for the left boundary, and an integral term. The integral term also always, whenever we set the coefficients of delta w to zero, will give us the differential equation of equilibrium, which we previously derived to be n prime plus pz equals zero. And this doesn't depend on boundary conditions. It's always the same. Boundary conditions now um, are going to be derived by looking at the boundary terms. So the boundary conditions on the right boundary, we can look we can derive it by looking at the, this term here, where we're going to see that P minus N at L times delta W at L equals zero. We don't know the displacement at L, the actual displacement at L, and as such, delta W at L is an arbitrary number, so the only way that the multiplication will always be zero is that P minus N at L is equal to zero. So this tells us that N at L equals P. So this is the boundary condition on the right-hand side. While on the left-hand side, we know that W at zero is always zero. So delta W at zero is zero because uh, as we agreed in the definition of virtual displacement is that they should satisfy always the boundary condition. So this means that this term here, which is the term corresponding to the left boundary, is always zero regardless of the value of n. So we don't know anything about n at zero. We only know something about n at the right-hand side. So what we know about this problem is that n prime plus pz equals zero. This is the equilibrium equation in z. We know that n at L equals P, which is also uh, an okay thing. We know the value of n at the right-hand side. And we also know from the kinematic boundary condition that W at 0 equals 0. So for this problem here, we have an equilibrium equation and two boundary conditions. One of them is on the force, and one of them is on Displacement. So it is always the case like this. On each boundary, the variation statement will always let you choose whether you want to specify a displacement or the corresponding force. So essentially, if you specify at a certain point the displacement in the direction, you cannot at the same point specify the force in that direction. Either you specify the force or you specify the displacement. Yeah. Now we can repeat the same um, steps as we used for the equilibrium equation, uh, sum of the forces in z equals zero. We can repeat the same procedure for um, also the variation of delta u, which will give us sigma forces in x is zero, and variation of delta v, which will give us sigma forces in uh, y is equal to zero. Uh, they are exactly the same, so I'm not going to repeat that. So what I'm going to do is just list the equilibrium equation for forces. Yeah. So force equilibrium is going to be composed of three equations. One of them says n plus prime plus pz equals zero. So then sx prime plus px equals zero and sy prime plus py 
Um, this might be slightly different from what some other books derive, other than Nexon, which the reference we're using, because in many books, the rate of change of the shear force is the applied load per unit length. This has something to do with the sign convention that Nexon uses for shear forces. So more or less, with our sign convention, these equations are, are valid, and they are the same for all three types of forces. So normal force, shear force in x direction, and shear force in y direction. So this is as much as force equilibrium is concerned. For moment equilibrium, we can start again also by moment around z. So, so let us look at moment equilibrium around z. We will see here uh, that the corresponding total virtual work is due to a delta theta z is given by minus integration mz delta theta z prime plus integration of mz delta theta z dz. So, this looks exactly the same as the equation for uh, axial forces or normal forces. So you can easily see that the equilibrium equation when you integrate by parts is going to give you pretty much the same expression. So you will end up with mz prime plus mz equals zero. And this is the moment equilibrium in the direction. So, the three force equilibria and the moment equilibrium around the z-axis exactly take the same form, where the rate of change is the internal force plus the distributed load equals zero. The difference will start becoming, things will become slightly different when we go to moment around x or moment around y. So let us consider moment equilibrium around y. If you look at the terms which contain delta theta y in the virtual work principle, this will look like this. And they, they all come from internal forces. We will have my delta theta y prime plus sx delta theta y z. So you have two terms, a term which depends on the shear force and a term which depends on the bending moment. So when we integrate this by parts, and let us say that we have a situation, for example, where we have a cantilever beam like this with a force F here and a moment C here. And, and, and these are moments around Y. And the force F is in X, so maybe, uh, yeah. So this is Z, this is X, then Y would be coming out of the page, and as such, the force is in this direction, and the moment is in this direction. So the work done, okay, yeah. 
this distributed load is not going to be important for us. Of course, but it is kind of type of typical loading situation that we can expect uh, we can expect to have. So let us integrate by parts. As far as delta theta y coefficients are concerned, there will be an external work done by C, which is plus C delta theta y at S. So when we integrate by parts now, we are going to get m y delta theta y at L minus m y delta theta y at zero plus integration from zero to L m y prime delta theta y. plus C delta theta y at n. Yeah. So from there, we can easily derive uh, our equilibrium equations. Of course, the term containing Sx is copied as is because it doesn't contain any derivatives of delta theta y. So the coefficient of delta theta y when we set the virtual world to zero is going to be minus m y prime plus s x equals zero, which gives us the condition that m y prime equals s x. And the boundary condition is going to be at uh, z equals L, delta theta y as L is free, so the coefficient of delta theta y should be zero, and this will give us that, for example, m y at L is equal to minus C, yeah. While delta theta y at zero is going to be always zero because of the boundary condition, and as such, this term is always going to be zero. So this will give us our differential equation and boundary conditions on the moment. You can easily see that the rate of change of the bending moment is equal to the shear force, which is the equation that we over here. So in summary, the moment equations around x and y will reduce to m x prime equals s y and m y prime equals s x. Yes. And this finished the set of equations of equilibrium for B. So the equations of equilibrium beams consist of six equations, three force equations and three moment equations. And we have derived all of these based on the principle of virtual work. So now after deriving the equilibrium equation, it is um, interesting to start thinking about <coughs> a special case, uh, which is the most relevant in practice. What we have done so far is we assumed in our displacement field that the orientation of the cross-section is absolutely independent of the displacement of the beam axis. So essentially what we allowed is a situation where a beam might be formed in this way. So this is the undeformed beam this is the beam axis, and we allowed a deformation which is in this form, where the beam axis does not, 
where the beam axis does not deform. At all, so the displacements are zero, but the rotation of the cross section is non zero because the orientation of the section is changing. But this type of deformation is highly unlikely in very long beams. So if you have a very slender beam, we can make an assumption which is similar to the assumption we made for plates. We can assume that section. remain normal to the max. And this is the Euler Bernoulli assumption. Yeah. So if we take a small element of the beam of which delta Z, think about it this way. This is how it would locally rotate. So this is Z after rotation. And let us say this is Y. where x would be pointing into uh, into the page. And here is where we started. So this is before deformation. And this is after deformation. So it is not difficult here to see that the slope of the center line is the same as um, is the same as the angle of rotation of the cross section, uh, except that the rotation here is not around x. Uh, the rotation is around minus x. So it's not difficult to see that in this case, d prime equals minus theta x where V prime is the slope of the center line. And the same goes in the other plane where we can show that U prime equals theta y. So these two conditions are the two conditions that guarantee that that cross-section orientation after it rotates it's still perpendicular to the beam axis after it deforms. And as you can easily see, it links displacements and rotations. So right now, the two rotations, theta x and theta y, are no longer independent of the displacements of the center line of the beam axis, but they are actually dependent on them. So what we can do is we can substitute these conditions into the expression for the virtual work done by the internal forces to find that the virtual work of internal forces now is minus integration n delta w prime minus mx delta v double prime minus my delta u double prime plus m z delta theta z prime z. Interestingly enough, the two terms which used to multiply the shear forces s x and s y will be identical in here. So essentially, the shear forces no longer appear in the expression of the virtual world done by internal forces. So what we have in this case is that the total virtual work 
which is supposed to be zero for equilibrium is going to look something like this. Of course, plus any external work done by concentrated forces or moments, which we can include for special cases. Anyway, what we see here is that all of a sudden, we no longer have six different functions that appear in the expression of the total virtual work. Uh, but only four. So we have the three displacements, U, V, W, and the rotation around Z, which is Z. And this seems to indicate that we are going to get, instead of six equilibrium equations, we are going to get only four equilibrium equations. Equilibrium equation that says force in Z equals zero, sum of moment around Z equals zero, and then two equations would say sigma forces in x and sigma forces in y are equal to z. Looking at the expression we have right now, it's very clear that the equations for uh, force equilibrium and moment equilibrium in the z, z direction are not going to be altered. What is going to change is the force and moment equilibrium around, uh, around y. Yeah. So let us now uh, go back, and so this is essentially y, yeah, this is z, and x is pointing out of, uh, of the page, and let us say that we have here a distribution of forces by y, and this is a cantilever, and uh, I'll assume that there is an applied force S here. Yeah. And a moment around X. And call it M naught. And let us derive the equation of motion for equilibrium in Y direction. So, in order to derive the equation, uh, of equilibrium, force equilibrium in Y, we need to consider the coefficient of delta V. And in order to do that, the total virtual work with only delta V non-zero is going to look like MX delta V double prime dz plus integration of Qi delta V dz. And since we have concentrated forces and moments here, we are going to have force times displacement at that point. So we have plus S delta V S L. But what about the moment? The moment M naught should multiply um, the displacement at that point, and since the moment is around minus x, then we should multiply it by the rotation along minus x, so the negative of the rotation around x. But the negative of the rotation around x, really, uh, is not an unknown anymore, because we see here that the negative of the rotation around x is actually nothing but V prime, which is the slope, uh, the slope uh, of the curve. So essentially, what we can do here is we say uh, 
this is plus m naught minus delta theta x at L and this we can replace by delta V prime at at L based on the older Bernoulli assumptions. Uh, excuse me, uh, X in this case is actually pointing into the page to go through with the right hand rule. So this means that this is actually a plus sign. So now we can replace this by minus delta V prime at S. Now since delta V has two derivatives in the expression of total virtual world, we need to integrate by parts twice. So integration by parts would give us mx delta v prime from 0 to n minus mx prime delta v from 0 to n plus integration from 0 to n mx double prime delta v dz. So this is the first term. The second term will give us integration from 0 to L dy delta v dz. And then we have the boundary terms, which is s delta v at L minus delta v prime L. So collecting terms, we start, and of course all this is equal to zero because the total virtual work is equal to zero at equilibrium. So collecting terms, we get integration from zero to n, m x double prime plus p y delta v d z plus. mx at L minus the note delta v prime at L. The terms that contain delta v prime at zero and delta v at zero are always zero because both the displacement and the slope are zero at the fixed end. So these automatically disappear. We end up with another expression which is which says S minus M X prime at L delta V prime at L equals zero. So setting the coefficients, sorry, this is delta V of course. So setting the coefficients of independent variations uh, to zero, we obtain the equilibrium condition, which is mx double prime plus py equals zero. And we obtain two force net or, or natural boundary conditions, which is that the bending moment at L equals the applied moment, yeah, and we have mx prime at L equals the applied force. Interestingly enough, we do know from the equilibrium equations that we previously uh, derived is that uh, we know that mx prime equals sy and that sy prime plus uh, uh, excuse me uh, plus py equals zero. So actually substituting from the second equation into the first equation, 
uh, we can eliminate x y, but or alternatively we can also substitute the first equation into the second equation. So substituting from the first into the second, we obtain that in x double prime plus p y equals zero, which is the same equation we derived for the Euler Bernoulli beam. So essentially the equilibrium equation that we got for the Euler Bernoulli beam is consistent with the equilibrium equations derived by assuming independent rotations and displacement. But and if we look at the boundary condition here of um, the derivation based on the Euler Bernoulli uh, assumption, we find that the derivative of the bending moment is equal to the applied force. And assuming that this is the correct uh, sign convention for shear forces, which it is, then we can, what we can do is we can name for Euler Bernoulli problems we can define the shear force yeah it's y to be the derivative of the bending moment yeah this is now in the, in the definition this is not an independent equation of equilibrium yeah in which case we can rewrite the second order equation exactly in the same form as two equations of first order as we obtained using independent rotation. And the boundary conditions at L would be that mx at L is equal equal the applied the new moment and the shear force at L also equals the applied uh, shear force. So at the end of the day, we can derive the equations of equilibrium in two ways, one of them based on uh, the assumption of independent displacement of the center line and independent rotation of the cross section. This leads us to six equilibrium equations. Or we can uh, derive them taking into account the euler bernoulli assumption, which tells us that after rotation, the section remains normal to the center line or to the beam axis. Uh, in which case we obtain only four equilibrium equations, but for the case of Euler Bernoulli theory, these four differential equations, two of them are of the second order, while in the first uh, approach we end up with six equations of the first order, and as we have seen here, both the boundary conditions and the differential equations will be exactly equivalent to each other. So essentially, the big difference between the Euler Bernoulli assumption and without the Euler Bernoulli assumption is not in the equilibrium equation. You always end up with a consistent set of equilibrium equations. The big difference is in the expression of virtual work. If you look at the expression of virtual work of internal forces, we see that it is minus integration. And this expression here um, has fewer terms than the expression without the Euler Bernoulli assumption because here we don't need to uh, know the shear forces. And as such, when we derive the expression of the stream energy from the principle of virtual work, which we're going to do in the next lecture. Uh, we need only to model the total normal force, the two bending moments, and the twisting moment 
and there is no need for explicit modeling of the shear force. So we don't need to calculate strain energy due to shear. We need only to consider strain energy due to extension, bending, and twist. And this is uh, what we're going to do in the next lecture. And this would allow us to start using the principle of minimum total potential energy to derive uh, not only equilibrium equations and boundary conditions, but also to derive approximate solutions also for being for being problems.